Uh, welcome, everyone. <clears throat> um, tonight's talk is going to be on the poly cannon uh, and how the uh, authenticity of the uh, Buddhist teachings has been maintained uh, over 2,600 years. And it really is a remarkable story. Uh, but first, we'll meditate. So find your relaxed meditative posture. And gently close your eyes and gently close your mouth. Thank you. We'll start again. So we'll begin with a 20 minute meditation. So again, find your relaxed meditative posture. One more time. Hello, Stefan. <laughs> Good to see you. Excuse me. I'm glad you're here. And holding your back straight, but not stiff. Your ears aligned with your shoulders, and nose aligned with your navel. But holding yourself very loosely, very lovingly. Allow yourselves to settle into this room. Settle onto your seats. Settle into your bodies. And take a moment to become aware of the sensation of breathing in your body. Just get a feel for what that's like. To be mindful of your breath in your body. And while remaining mindful of your breath in your body, notice that thoughts are flowing. We're conscious beings, thoughts should be flowing. The purpose of meditation is to not be distracted by your own thoughts. So when you find that you're caught up in your thinking again, simply acknowledge that and return your mindfulness to the sensation of breathing. I'll repeat that. When you find that you're caught up in your thinking again, simply acknowledge that and return your mindfulness to the sensation of breathing. Relaxing your thoughts, remaining mindful of your breathing. <clears throat> and we'll meditate for 20 minutes with callbacks every five minutes.
relaxing thoughts, remaining mindful of your breathing. <clears throat> Relaxing thoughts, remaining mindful of your breathing.
relaxing thoughts, remaining mindful of your breathing. Persistent thought or feeling arises, stay with it for a moment or two, <clears throat> recognize it as impermanent, and return your mindfulness to the sensation of breathing. And we'll meditate for five more minutes.
Take a moment to notice the quality of your mind. Be at peace with your mind. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. You're getting there, Judy. Um, so the Poly Cannon. This is if you've read this article up until a week ago, it was a rather short article and didn't get into a lot of detail. But I've rewritten it over the past six months or so, maybe longer, um, and it's now around 7,000 words. Um, so we're going to be here a while tonight, probably till early tomorrow morning at least. Um, no, I'm just going to synopsize. Uh, and it's also included now in the in the new book that is just out called Becoming Buddha. Um, at the end of that book. Um, the, the preservation of the Buddha's original teachings 2,600 years ago, I think, is one of the most remarkable stories and probably one of the most important stories in human history. Um, and how it came about is a direct result of the Buddha's Dhamma himself. In other words, that Dhamma allowed they were learning the Dhamma to contemporaneously remember it. And the practice even then was once a monk attained a certain level and he was prepared or the Buddha decided that he was, uh, he understood enough to now start teaching on his own, was given the job of, of memorizing certain significant suttas, reciting that to his students, his direct group of students, and then they would go out teaching it. And then that resulted uh, later on after the Buddha's death and what would happen in the first Buddhist council, we'll all talk about, uh, in this remarkable way that these suttas are, have been preserved, um, seeing the meaning of the Buddhist teachings isn't lost after all these years. It really is remarkable. Um, during the Buddhist time, there was writing. Um, probably, you know, the historians say the writing probably originated with the Greeks, and there was already um, uh, books around. But the written word, as far as preserving something that was important, wasn't given a lot of, there wasn't a lot of confidence in it. And an oral recitation was given much more confidence than uh, the written word, uh, which contradicts everything that we would believe today. But until you think about that, when you have a group of people that are reciting the same thing over and over again, and another group of people are hearing that same thing over and over again, it's constantly checked for accuracy, isn't it? And this is something that would be employed at the first Buddhist council. What is most important is that through that oral recitation, the common human problem to adapt and accommodate things to fit your own view, which is often what is entered into a written record, is impossible here. And again, this is so important for understanding how this, how this all came about. Um, and it's the consistency that you find, let's go back a little bit. The, the Pali Canon consists of three books. The first book is called the Vinaya Pitaka, and that is a rather lengthy um, illustration of the uh, monastic discipline at the time. And it's interesting, it's an interesting book because it reflects a lot of the, um, the political climate that was occurring. And there's just some really, just very interesting stories in there. Uh, and there's, there's some benefit to it in, reflect, in, in understanding the Buddhist teachings, but it's not really necessary to do that. Uh, the next book, called the Sutta Pitaka, is the collection of, of the suttas that the Buddha gave while he was alive and, and remembered and authenticated, just in the way I described. The third book that's included in the, in the Pali Canon, the modern Pali Canon, is called the Abhidhamma. Um, scholars, uh, scholars of comparative religion, continue to argue whether this was actually a teaching of the Buddha or not. 
uh, it's quite different than anything that's included in the suttas. I, I don't think there's any way that you could say that the Abhidhamma is, was a direct teaching of the Buddha. It gets into um, very mystical accounts of the Buddha's teachings. It, it completely contradicts the Buddha's teaching on dependent origination and, um, and incorporates dependent origination, but not even using the other, the other part, parts of that as a creation myth and to, to describe in a very mystical way how everything in the physical world came to be. That's part of the Abhidhamma. A lot of psychological um, stuff in there. Um, it's interesting. Helen. Can you translate the, the meaning of the names of the three books? It might be easier to remember them. Yeah, well, Vinaya means discipline. Uh, Sutta means the Dhamma. And so that's often referred to as, as the Dhamma and the discipline. When the Buddha is talking about what he taught, he usually refers to, or often refers to it that way, as the Dhamma and the discipline. You can't separate the discipline from the Dhamma. One of the things, this is, this is an example of, of the Vinaya, of the discipline. When you're gathered in this room, practice right speech or observe noble silence. That was the overriding um, governing instruction to the, to the original Sangha. When you're gathered as a Sangha, which they were 24-7, you speak only of, of the Sangha and you relate what you're talking about in the Dhamma. In other words, you don't, get, you don't get into the chariot races that are coming up tonight in town or anything like that. And I, it's also reflected in, and the only reason I'm talking about this is because it's, it's this week, is my retreats. I don't run silent retreats. One of the reasons is the Buddha never, his Sangha was never in silence. He never had forced silence. But what he did as a way of encouraging developing the entire Dhamma was encourage right speech. And so obviously if you're just withdrawn from the world and practicing silence, you could be with a million people practicing silence, but there's no opportunity to practice the Dhamma in that silence. So it's a great question. The third, um, Abhidhamma, it's a, it's a tough one to translate it, but usually what, what they're referring to in Abhi is advanced. Um, so you can see even right there, the Buddha never taught anything advanced, and now this is being portrayed as an advanced teaching. And it's often um, maintained that way, that this is, the Abhidhamma is, is the real stuff. It's for those people that, that have really advanced, and they could really, okay. Um, I read it. it. It doesn't impress me as really of much of anything except interpretations of how people would want to want the Dhamma to be. And I, get, I'm, I may get into it in, ten, in tonight's talk, but it, I do get into it in a lot of detail in this article um, and how the Abhidhamma has been used to um, the Buddha taught. Its inclusion in the Pali Canon is also interesting and it's part of the story. So did I answer your question? Okay. Um, well, let me, let me read about the, uh, a little bit about how the, how the councils uh, maintain these teachings. So uh, the Buddha taught for 45 years. Everything he taught for those 45 years was taught in the context of the Four Noble Truths. The reason why I keep saying that, I, I probably say it nearly every class, is for many, many years I was involved in Buddhism in general. And for many, many years I kept getting more confused and more frustrated and blaming myself that I, me, that I just can't get this and uh, and I, I bought into the idea that this is so deep and so profound that it takes endless lifetimes to finally understand it. Okay, you know, but I really like something I can hold my hat on, hang my hat on in this lifetime. It was never presented to me, and it, it never occurred to me until I actually studied that second book of the Pali Canon. And then, you know, the light went off, and it made perfect sense what the Buddha was trying to teach. It made perfect sense how to apply it in my life, and it literally changed my life. And that's why the only thing that I teach and the only thing that I practice is what can be found in the, in the Sutta Patakas. For me, there's no other reason to go outside of it because this is the only thing that we know that was actually taught by the Buddha. And why would I want to, if I'm practicing Buddhism, why would I want to practice something that is an interpretation of what the founder taught? Um, and again, that's, that's, how I, that's how it's not confusing to me. Now, the way it's developed over time, um, is very interesting because it relates directly to the common human need or that aspect of conditioned thinking to adapt something to fit your own views, which is exactly what happens. Let me get into this a little bit. And you'll see where the split, in, in writing this out, it, it became very clear to me, something that was even at this stage in my life, 
a little bit cloudy as to exactly where the split took place and why, but you'll see you'll see how this how this happened and it's completely understandable. Um, I'm, I'm uh, I just glossed over the introduction. There's a lot there, but enough to put this in context. And just let me the five books of the Pali Canon of the Sutta Pitaka or the Diga Nikaya, which are the long discourses. The um, the collection of the suttas is not collect. It's not presented in a in a chronological order, and and really for a very good reason. So that if you remember, if you think back, this is an oral tradition. If what you're trying to recount, you remember, was a rather long talk by the Buddha, you would know to go to the Deacon Nikaya because that's where the long talks were kept. And if you remember that it was a talk that was specifically about uh, a numerical teaching, such as the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path you would go to the Kadaka Nikaya because that's the book that is grouped together by numbers, not the, the topics are a certain number. Um, if you remember that it was a middle, a, a rather a shorter talk, a middle length talk, you go to the middle length discourses, the Majima Nikaya. If it was a short talk, again, you might go to Kadaka Nikaya or you might go to the Dhammapada, depends on the, so on the topic. So these things by basically <clears throat> the length of the content? The length of the content but, so, uh, content, but sometimes the numerical subject involved. So the, 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 uh, the second book is the Majima Nikaya, the middle length disc discourses, the Samyutta Nikaya, which are the group tor discourses, meaning they're grouped by a certain theme. And this is, the, the Samyutta Nikaya really has the meat of the Dhamma. So in other words, you might find in the Samyutta Nikaya, you'll find the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, the Sutta on the Four Noble Truths. Say that yeah, that's why I like saying it. Uh, right after that, you might find an additional discourse on the Eightfold Path, even though it was included in the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, grouped together. And you'll also find, because it leads into that, uh, suttas on the five clinging aggregates, because that's the personal experience of suffering described in the Four Noble Truths myself clear about how they group these together. Uh, the Angatara Nikayas, which are the expanded discourses grouped by the number of topics covered. So it's where a Buddha might give a very succinct teaching and then expand on it. And then group similar to the way the Samyana Nikaya is grouped. And then the Kadaka Nikaya, which is the collection of short books um, consisting of 15 smaller books, um, except the Burmese edition, which has 18 books, but it's really I'm getting too technical here. It's really the original 15 books, but just split up a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the Sutta Nikaya. That is the entire teachings of the Buddha. Um, it, uh, it's 10,000 pages long or so. It's, it's pretty long. There's a lot of repetition. It's, it's a little bit of a difficult read, especially when you lose the context or, or fail to remember that everything the Buddha taught was in the context of Four Noble Truths. But when you read it, the thing that's, that's most striking to me, and it's, what, again, one of those things that hit me like a ton of bricks, was the consistency of everything that the Buddha taught. And everything was consistent in that context of the Four Noble Truths. Um, I'm just skipping ahead. So this is the first Buddhist council. This took place about a month after the Buddha passed, specifically for the reason to recount and preserve the teachings of the Buddha. And there's two main actors in here. Upali, who had a, uh, a great grasp of the Vinaya, and he was asked to recount his understanding of the Vinaya. And Ananda, who is asked to recount the actual suttas themselves. And the reason why that's important is Ananda was the Buddha's cousin and his second, his attendant, for the last 25 years of his life. Uh, for the previous 20 years, he was there for most of the suttas, and he was there for every single sutta the Buddha would present in the last 25 years of his life. And he had developed a word-perfect memory. He was known for that. And most of the monks and nuns had very good memories. Why? Because they, they had developed such a level of concentration within the framework of the Eightfold Path. And they also had developed right view. In other words, they had the correct view to see the Dhamma correctly. Uniquely, uniquely qualified to establish this, the Sutta Pitaka. The, uh, the oral tradition was already established uh -huh. and was used in, in other religions and oh, yeah. probably even in uh, plays and uh, in plays of storytelling. Yes, well, all the time. There, again, there was a written tradition, but it was hardly ever used, and especially for something important. And the, the Vedas, um, 
precursor to modern Hinduism, something the Buddha studied and the Upanishads that came into his favor during the Buddha's life. Um, they were probably written down, but there's no historical proof, but they were continually preserved by oral traditions and by teachers at that time. The Jains were another sect that were uh, contemporary, contemporary, contemporaries of the Buddha, uh, and they, they also used an oral tradition to, for their teaching. They didn't write anything down. Are they associated with Qigong also? The Jains? No, no, that's it. I don't think so. There's any connection. There is, there are separate. Um, there are some some minor similarities between Jainism and Buddhism. In fact, there's and Jainism, the Jain religion is still a prominent religion today. It's not something that's faded. Um, but there are some very very significant differences. In fact, I think it's Tuesday's talk. I'll be giving on the Kula Sakaka Sutta, which is a, uh, a a debate between the Buddha and Sakaka, who was a same uh, a Jain teacher, a prominent Jain teacher, who decided that he was going to. Boy, I'm really getting off topic. I'm going to debate the Buddha and show him how foolish he is. And of course, the Buddha, in his calm way, is the, just the opposite. That he didn't. It, his his teachings didn't hold up to what the Buddha was teaching. So. Uh, the first Buddhist council. During his teaching career, the Buddha's discourses were memorized by senior monks and nuns contemporaneously and re repeated in small groups to check for accuracy. These monks and nuns had extraordinary memories, likely due to their highly developed concentration. By repeating these memorized discourses, they were able to accurately maintain the teachings. And this is likely the beginning of Buddhist chant and was not so much a religious ritual as it was a most skillful way to preserve and present the Dhamma through repetition. And again, I'm not putting down the modern tradition of Buddhist chant almost as a worship, um, but it was just a practical reason. They would, and that's why there's a lot of repetition in the Pali Canon too, because the Pali Canon is a recounting of this oral repetition. It's used in all, all religions. I mean, oh, yeah. The, the, the chanting to remember it. Yeah. It's the rhythm. Yeah. And that's an important thing. Again, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with using chant for other reasons, um, but the main reason is, is for memorization, for an accurate recounting of it. This method of maintaining an accurate record of the teachings of the Buddha continued after his passing. The first Buddhist council was held, why do I have three months in here? Because it wasn't. It was a month after the Buddha's passing in Rajagaha. The purpose of this council and subsequent councils was to maintain the authenticity of the Buddha's Dhamma. A well-respected respected monk, Mahakasapa, convened the first council. He was joined by approximately 500 other monks who had fully developed the Buddha's teachings. Now, there was thousands and thousands of monks and nuns by that time. But the only monks that were allowed to be a part of this council were ones that were already recognized as having awakened, having achieved arahantship. A little interesting side note is upon the Buddha's passing, Ananda was not yet recognized as being awakened. And so he heard that he was not going to be invited to this council and he was upset. And he decided that I'm going to better hurry up and I'm going to meditate until I awaken. And wouldn't you know that that, know it, that, that strong determination led to Ananda's awakening prior, just prior to the to the first council. And so he was invited, and that's important because it, it really is because of his memory and his position during the Buddha's life uh, that allowed this to take place. It was decided that the recording of the Buddha's lifetime of teaching should be separated into two general categories. Uh, the Vinaya would be recounted by Upali, known for his thorough understanding of monastic discipline, and checked through ac for accuracy from the others in attendance. This became the first book of the Pali Canon, the Vinaya Pitaka. The Buddha's chief attendant during his last 25 years of, of life. Uh, Ananda was known to have a word perfect memory. He was questioned on verifiable facts about the location of the discourse he was reciting, the subject being taught, and the person or people present when the discourse was presented. So, many, probably 95% of the suttas will start with, Thus have I heard. When you read that in a sutta, you know that that thing is 2,600 years old and goes back to the first Buddhist council. This is Ananda saying, this is what I heard. Thus have I heard. And then usually there'll be a description. You hear me say it all the time. The Buddha was at Savati, at Jita's Grove, Anatha Pandika's monastery. A lot of the suttas were taken there, especially from the Samyana Nikaya. That's exactly how it was recounted. And the reason why that's important is that these 500 other monks 
could say, yes, I remember it was that took place there. I remember who was there. Ananda was right. I remember this, this season. And that establishes the authenticity. Obviously, Ananda was right, right from the very, very beginning. Right in place, right in season or time, right in the people that were in attendance. And sometimes it was just one person, and he would say that. He would say that this is a discourse between the Buddha and so-and-so, like the Kola Sakaka Sutta. It's, it's a the, verbal audit trail. Exactly. And and it really can't be denied until unless unless there's a reason why you want to deny it, unless you want to change something here. You want to create something else. And I'll get into that in a minute. And, and again, what is surprising is it's so hard to refute this, isn't it? Except it does come up. Um, so Ananda, blah, 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 blah. It was after, after Ananda gave his talks, um, and this, this first council lasted about, I think, five months, if I remember correctly. It's in here. Um, it was then accepted that Ananda retained a true, accurate, and complete recollection of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, the next couple uh, paragraphs get into about the written text. Um, so over the next seven months, the 500 monks recited their own memories of the Buddha's teachings, and those recita recitations were also compared for consistency and accuracy. It was then accepted by the entire council that what was presented was an accurate and complete presentation of the teachings of the Buddha, and that became the Sutta Pitaka, the second book of the canon. There was no mention at this first council of anything that would later be the Abhidhamma Pitaka. Uh, two important developments occurred at this first council. A question arose about relaxing some of the rules including in, it included in the Vinaya. Just prior to his passing, the Buddha did tell Ananda that it would be acceptable if a few of the minor rules were relaxed, but he passed before he could specify what those rules were. Decided by Mahakasapa that since there was no way of knowing what rules could be relaxed, that the Vinaya should be accepted as it was recounted. It was also decided that the Sutta Pitaka be divided into sections that are very similar to the five Nikayas that I just talked about. A senior monk and his direct pupils were given the responsibility to memorize different sections here, and that oral tradition was now established. Daily recitations of the Dhamma was then presented by various groups, always verified by others in attendance. In other words, if a teacher now started recounting something that was already now, was now included in the in the Sutta Pitaka, and even a couple words, he might have said that the Buddha was at um, in Rajagaha when he was in Savati. He would be reminded, no, no, you have that detail wrong, correct it. And so immediately, the establishment the, of the authenticity of the canon was taking place. The consistency and rele relevancy preserved in the Pali Canon to its early, earliest teachings is remarkable and a testament to this method, method of preserving the, vood, the suttas and the Vinaya. Why am I having such a hard time? Talking? Maybe because I'm trying to fit, fit too much into tonight's teaching. So I'll slow down a little bit. Most historians agree that an oral tradition shared and consistently verified by many is much more accurate than isolated individuals writing from their me memory what they individually remembered and occurred. As will be seen in future adaptations and accommodations to the Buddha's Dhamma, this will be proven entirely true. It was, it was when the adaptations were being made and, and then later on when different sutras were starting to be introduced that it was the individual interpretations and the individual recounting that changed the Buddha in such a way that it's almost irrecon irreconcilable with what he additionally taught. The second Buddhist council. The method of recitation and comparison continued through later Buddhist councils. The second Buddhist council met approximately 100 years after the first council. This was convened to continue to check for accuracy and authenticity and to again look at the Vinaya, the monastic rules. There continued to be a desire among some groups to both relax some rules and to impose new rules. The second council, a revisionist group known as the Mahasangikas, emerged. The Mahasangikas protested some of the basic rules of discipline. And they also desired a more visionary and mystical dharma. Uh, and this is a little bit of my speculation, but what, they're, what they want to start introducing as Buddhist practice seems to be strongly influenced by what is found into the Vedas and the Upanishads. So um, they wanted a dharma practice that would establish the Buddha now as a god and one of many Buddha gods ex extending infinitely back into the past and infinitely into the future. And if you think about that, when you can, of 
a man that awakened and now create a supernatural being out of it, then you can justify just about anything that follows. And it's interesting how that, how that one significant change led to what is now um, modern Mahayana Buddhism. And again, I always, I got a disclaimer in here about six times and I keep saying it. I'm not putting it down, but it's very important to understand if we're going to be practicing Buddhism, to at least understand what the founder taught and what was developed. And it's it's kind of like if you if you really like to practice early Christianity, you can do that. And if you like to to practice something later, you can do that too. And there's, it doesn't mean that one's better than the other, but it's important to understand what we're practicing. Um, the Mahasangika has created further divisiveness in the Sangha and contradiction contradiction to the Buddha's Dhamma by claiming that the Buddha's life as a human being was merely an apparition. Again, immediately establishing the justification for what would follow. The, the Buddha's life didn't even happen. If he, the Buddha's life didn't even happen, then he didn't teach anything, did he? Or he didn't teach anything that was real. Uh, Contradiction was necessary to support the Buddha as one God among many gods and to justify any and all adaptations and accommodations that would follow. Once the Buddha was established as a supernatural being, then the Dharma can be found in any realm and in any presentation with no authentication necessary save for the claim that the now supernatural Buddha presented a particular teaching in a certain way. Uh, there's another disclaimer there. As will be shown further further on when these supernatural teachings are compared to what the Buddha taught while in his physical body, the many inconsistencies and contradictions become apparent. Either the Buddha taught many contradictory dharmas throughout history and prehistory, and in many realms, physical and otherwise, or he taught a cohesive, direct, useful, and accessible, accessible dharma that has been successfully preserved in the second book of the Pali Canon. And that's for each of us to decide by clear examination. Another reason why I feel that this is so important is to understand is that for many, many, many years, I was a practicing Buddhist and I didn't understand that I was not practicing something that the Buddha taught, or at least it was never presented that way, that there's another, there's another, there's an alternative to this. It was all presented um, from that viewpoint that Buddha was a supernatural being and he presented these teachings in many different realms and those many different realms and those many different teachings led to the different Buddhist schools rather than there is a original accounting of the Buddhist teachings and again that's what made all the difference for me that's why I teach what I teach whatever is believed to be true these changes altered the Buddhist teachings in profoundly significant ways and would lead to the development of the modern Mahayana traditions the third Buddhist council, approximately 120 years after the second council, during the reign of King Ashoka, and you've heard me talk about the importance of King Ashoka to the preservation of the Dhamma too, uh, the third council convened. By now, following the license taken by the Mahasangikas, various sects have formed, all with a desire to adapt and accommodate the Dhamma to fit their views of what the Dharma should be. Now, I'm using the word Dhamma and Dharma interchangeably, but Dhamma means the original teachings of the Buddha. Dharma is what has been adapted and accommodated since then. The president of that council, Magalaputta Tisa, compiled a book called the Katavatu to refute some of the heretical and obviously false teachings coming into vogue. Tisa also included the more mystical practices that were becoming accepted as Dhamma practice that he enjoyed. And so that Katava, the Katavatu eventually became one of the books of the Abhidhamma. And that was the Katavatu was the first written record called Buddhism. And notice that it's a, it's a contradictory and somewhat Protestant form of what the Buddha taught, the first book. And it would be included in the Abhidhamma. That was sponsored, uh, Tissa was part of a group called, that was calling themselves now the Theravadins. To separate themselves from the Mahasangikas, the Theravadins considered themselves that Theravada means the, the, uh, the, the teachings of the elders to mean that they were practicing the authentic teachings of the Buddha and anybody else was practicing something different. At that time, the Mahasangikas, and a little bit later, another group that I'll mention in just a moment. I won't go on all night with this because it really could take all night, but just to make these, these few points. Um, sponsored by the Theravadans to separate and establish the Theravada sect and the division between the Buddha's direct teachings and what followed from the split with the Mahasangikas were now distinct. 
As far as can be found, the, Kat the Katavata became the first significant written document in Buddhist literature, although it was obviously not an account of the Buddhist teachings, but a reflection of individual opinion of what developing Buddhist practice should be. Introduction of the Katavatu, the method of oral tradition of recitation and confirmation, preserving the Vinaya and the Sutta Pitakas, continued. The two original books of the Pali Canon now have had an accepted and authenticated third book. This easily explains why many scholars disagree as to the ultimate authenticity of this third volume of the Canon. While adopting the more visionary and psychological teachings found in the Abhidhamma, but continuing to preserve the Vinaya and the Sutta Pitakas through oral tradition, the Theravadins established themselves to the Buddha's direct teachings due to their refutation of the Mahasangikas. Excuse me. Theravadins continue to consider themselves as part of the Hinayana, or original <laughs> branch of modern Buddhism. Modern Theravadin Buddhism is the least culturally and philosophically um, turn the page. Influence of modern day Buddhism, though there are significant differences between the Buddha's original teachings that can be traced back to this third council. So, even today, I get questions uh, mostly from online students. Um, so, you're a Theravadan Buddhism, Buddhist, aren't you? Because they see me more aligned with the original teachings. And I don't call myself a Theravadan, not that I'm putting them down. I don't see any reason to align with any group. What I do is I follow the Buddhist teachings as preserved in the Sutta Pitaka. And there are significant difference, differences now that you can trace back to this third council between modern Theravadins and what the Buddha actually taught. Again, I'm not putting them down. The, um, the Vipassana movement, which is one of the fastest growing Buddhist movements, um, uh, that originated in Burma by this gentleman called, I can't think of it, was Sasso Kim, uh, and then really made popular by the Sayadaws, uh, is really just a hybridized form of meditation that is stripped of everything else. But again, Vipassana, just because it's called Vipassana, it's part of Shamatha Vipassana, many people think, well, it's the same thing. It's, it's really not. And that is a kind of a subset of modern Theravada, the Vipassana movement. Again, not putting it down. People love it, but it's not what the Buddha taught. Um, there's another disclaimer there. So, so this is also when the split between the Hinayana and the Mahayana schools became firmly established, although there would be no historical reference to Hinayana or Mahayana until the beginning of the Common Era, and that's an even interesting story. When it became useful for the Mahayana branch to really make a point of the split is when they started using the word Hinayana as a as a derogatory way of pointing to the original teachings of the Buddha. In other words, Mahayana means the great teaching, Hinayana means the lesser teaching, but it was the original intention wasn't that. Hinayana got its name from the way that, that Buddhism traveled out of India, and it first went south, Sri Lanka, and then to Southeast Asia, and the Mahayana version went north into China, then Japan, South Korea, etc. in that route. So Hinayana simply meant the lower course or the lesser course, the southern course, and Mahayana meant the greater course pointing to the northern course, just a ge geographical location. But later on when it became significant, now Mahayana was the greater teaching. When was the actual uh, sutras actually written down? Uh, getting to that. Um, I just talked about this section, so. Okay, subsequent Buddhist councils. This will answer your question. There would be additional Buddhist councils following the third council, but by now the original Sangha had mostly lost identity. In other words, there wasn't, there wasn't one group that called itself anything that you could identify as the original, original Sangha. Still some practitioners. Us. Um, in the first century uh, before the Common Era, two competing sects had Held, held councils at approximately the same time. The Theravadins convened their council amid much political upheaval, and they continued the oral tradition of recitation and verification of the Pali Canon, and it was recorded, it was written down for the first time, including the Abhidhamma. So the first written record of the Pali Canon included all three books. What year was that? Um, about 100 years before the Common Era. Okay. So whatever that is, yeah. 20... <laughs> um, 
A competing council organized by the Sarvastivadins was used to introduce additional teachings that has further influenced modern Buddhism. The, the Sarvastivadins are often confused with the Theravadins simply because the last two syllables of their name, but they were significantly different uh, and more aligned with modern Mahayana teachings. A fifth Theravadin Buddhist council was held in 1871 in Burma, and this five-month council was used primarily to recite the now three books of the canon, to continue to check for authenticity to the original canon and later edition of the Abhidhamma. So interesting, they, they now had a written record, but they still relied on the oral tradition to check against that written record. In, 19, yeah, in 1954 in Rangoon, an international Theravadan council was convened that lasted two years. Again, the entire canon was recited and verified, and all three books were now carved into marble slabs that are still available. Oh there. my goodness, they carved all that into marble? Over two years, yeah. Oh. Uh, despite the addition of the Abhidhamma to the Pali Canon, the oral tradition of recitation and verification has preserved the original teachings of an awakened human being to this day. The preserved suttas continue the lineage of the Dhamma, first established by the Buddha. Um, let me just go a little bit further. The Abhidhamma is an extremely detailed theoretical and conceptual account of ordinary phenomena. And in essence, and what I mean by that is just, it, it, it's a overemphasized mystical accounting of, you know, what Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions of stars. It's just, it, <laughs> it, it creates mysticism over just the universe coming into existence. And, and the adaptation of, the, of dependent origination, to, to use that to describe it, in other words, well, that's what led to the, has led to the common belief and the misapplication of dependent origination to imply that all things are interdependent, everything is interconnected, and we all interbe. There's, there's physical proof for that. You know, again, Carl Sagan, we, there's parts of stars in all of us. We have the same basic physical components. While that's true, it has no bearing on Four Noble Truths. But by adapting it and make it, making it significant, it's tied to that teaching becomes significant. And it, again, it's an abrogation of dependent origination, which is a simple statement that from ignorance through 12 observable causative links, all manner of suffering arises. Most modern accounts of dependent origination don't even mention anything about the Buddha's teachings on dependent origination. And they'll even call it, this is what's found in the Paticca Samuppada of Abhanga Sutta. And then what is presented has nothing to do with it. But, be, well, because of that initial change, and I hope you're following me, by saying that the Buddha was not a human being, but a supernatural human being, and his, the story of his life was just an apparition, it didn't really happen, then anything that follows, if you want to believe it, is believable. You can't disprove something that is an outright lie because it didn't exist. You can't point to something and say, except through this accounting, that look here, it didn't, it wasn't here at this point, at the first council, but here it is at the third council. There is no link. And this gets into the way that lineages are established. The only lineage that I speak of, and that I and I mention it quite often, especially when I'm talking about the Ratana Sutta or the, the three refuges. The only lineage that was ever established by the Buddha was established in his Dhamma. And that lineage continues today through his Dhamma. And it's present in the Pali Canon, in the Sutta Patakas, and it's present right here in this room. And that's the only lineage that we should be con concerned about. And it's not a lineage that fl flows through me simply because I'm flapping my gums about it. It's a lineage that flows directly back to the Sutta Pitaka. Why? And how can we take confidence in it? because of the way it's been preserved all these years. Because there's never, there's never been any need to adapt it in any way or create another story to justify what would follow. And again, I know that I'm sounding like I'm judging harshly what has developed. I'm just trying to be clear about it. Fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, with, with some people it's not because it, it does sound like, I don't know. It, I, I honestly have a, have a hard time understanding why people would object to just simply pointing out what has taken place. but. But some people do. And again, I'm not doing it to make people uncomfortable. Um, many, many people. Um, I, I think it's important, and I've seen it firsthand, 
if you're going to practice this to understand what you're practicing and why you can take confidence in developing these teachings. And I don't want the supernatural. So, yeah, so in other words, there's nothing that we have to take on faith. For me to, for me to believe that a supernatural being presented these teachings, uh, well, let me just, let me just touch on, on this one just since I'm making the point. Um, and then I'll stop. It is told that the origin of the Abhidhamma occurred. This is, this is how it, it has been established. It is told that the origin of the Abhidhamma occurred when the Buddha, in the seventh year after his awakening, left the physical world for, for the realm of the Devas. And there, for the next three months, he taught what will become the third book of the canon. And that's the way that the Abhidhamma became an unintended link between the Theravadins and the developing Mahasanghikas. Because they incorporated that little bit. Now, maybe, again, there's no way to disprove that that didn't happen, is there? You can't disprove something like that. Perhaps the Buddha did leave for three months and somehow elevated himself to the realm of the Divas and gave this advanced teaching. And the rest of the story is that the teachings were preserved by the snake people for X number of years until humanity was ready and advanced enough to understand these advanced teachings. There's a, there's a lot of problems with that. Forget about the snake people. Well, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be, be, uh, make that a silly assumption. If you can believe in, in this, you can certainly believe in snake people. And maybe there was such a thing as snake people in this higher realm that actually did this. The problem then comes with this advanced teachings that are relayed. And I, I really could talk all night about this. Later on in this article, I talk about the, the, the sutras that are the hallmark of modern Buddhism, the Heart Sutra, Lotus Sutra, the Platform Sutra, and the Diamond Sutra. Um, and they all claim, if you read them, they are so inconsistent to the Buddhist teachings that, and they, they give their, their gain authenticity much the same way, although they're not included in the Abhidhamma, that these are advanced teachings that were preserved in the higher realms until humanity was ready to receive them, and then we can practice them. So there's... There's different patriarchs, lineages that trace that back, that, that now brought the Heart Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, et cetera, Platform Sutra, uh, and the Diamond Sutra. Now, the, the main problem with that is when you say that the Buddha gave these teachings to in a non-physical form, so that at some point in the future, when humanity is advanced enough to understand these teachings, then it grates everybody that was around when the Buddha's teachings and achieved awakening. And then how did they awaken? And if the Buddha was teaching something that was not useful, what did he do for 45 years of his life? He gave an awful lot of, I mean, he spent 45 years of his life teaching. But if you, if you believe that theory, it was 45 years of a completely wasted life because he wasn't teaching anything of any real importance. And then there's also a claim that, and this, this contradicts this claim, is that the reason why so many people awaken during the Buddha's time is that they were so karmically advanced. So on one hand, these people 2,600 years ago were so karmically advanced that they got this teaching instantly, and yet they were so behind the times that they weren't ready to receive the real true teaching. And again, I'm not putting this the whole story down. This is how it's presented. Decide for yourself what you want to follow. And now when you get into the, the, the Heart Sutra and the Lotus Sutra, um, are teachings that establish the Bodhisattva as the path, which is the, the Mahayana path is the Bodhisattva path. And it changes the application of emptiness to an environment and a teaching that there's no such thing as anything, including there's no such thing as a self, and that's not what the Buddha taught. It's using emptiness as almost as a destination and in, an environment to aspire to, to find yourself or establish yourself in. Rather than the Buddhist teachings on emptiness, and if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I gave that talk on the three discourses um, on emptiness. The Buddha used emptiness then and now to empty yourself of ignorant views. And again, the Heart Sutra and the Lotus Sutra both treat emptiness as a destination to develop in your own mind. Included in that emptiness is when you can empty yourself enough, Buddha nature will arise. Something else that the Buddha didn't teach. And that idea of the bodhisattva, the bodhisattva is the vow that I will 
delay my own awakening until all other beings are awakened is usually how it's presented or that I will seek awakening so that I can lead all others to awakening. When the Buddha refer referred to himself as a bodhisattva, which he did often in the Pali Canon, it was always in the past prior to his awakening. He would say, when I was an unawakened bodhisattva, blah, 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 this is what occurred. And what he's saying there, and he says it in his very first teaching, and he says it in the Nagara Sutta, which is another, the Nagara Sutta is the, the Buddha's direct recounting of what he went through, his, what, his developing understanding when he awakened. And he in that sutta, he directly relates it to dependent origination and uh, in the five clinging aggregates and emptiness. He had, he, in his awakening, he emptied himself of ignorant views. What's the actual meaning of the word? So in that sutta and other ones, he's, he's um, an unawakened bodhisattva. What he's referring to is even though he had some, in, 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 uh, for a human being, he had a very high level of compassion. He was concerned about all humanity. He was lacking the wisdom to properly implement that great compassion. And it wasn't until he became an awakened human being that he gained that wisdom, that he understood the nature of suffering. He understood dependent origination. It's dependent origination that was lacking in the mind of a bodhisattva. And it's dependent origination that is altered or dismissed completely to allow for what has come later. Am I clear on that? Because that's an important point. And again, I'm not putting anything down. So there's not such a thing as a awakened bodhisattva? Not according to the Buddha. Okay. So it's, but it's the word unawakened bodhisattva as, uh, yeah, I'm a bodhisattva. Is, is unawakened. Yes, and if you and there's a there's a set of books called the Jataka Tales that purport to recount the Buddha's previous lives, and they're like 500 to 800 lives that they talk about. I never found it completely useful as talking about reality. They're interesting stories, but all of those stories, if you if you read them, they show a developing. How do you I don't know how you call it? through all these lifetimes, a developing being becoming increasingly more compassionate. And, and, and there's, they're just beautiful stories of compassion. There's, there's a story about um, uh, a hungry, a hungry, I'm going to, I'm going to have to paraphrase. I don't remember it exactly, but a hungry tiger um, who, who was so hungry, but couldn't get any food and, and, and was so weak that that hungry tiger couldn't feed its babies. And the Buddha during that lifetime, I can't remember his name, laid down his life for the tiger so the tiger could rebuild its strength and feed its babies. That's one of the Chitaka tales. To me, it's, it's, I, would, I, don't, I don't take it as something that really occurred, but it's a beautiful tale of developing compassion, isn't it? And it's a beautiful tale of, of describing the levels of understanding that we all must go through to develop that great compassion of a bodhisattva and then take the leap to be an awakened human being by incorporating four noble truths into that mind of the bodhisattva, which is exactly what the Buddha described. And he says that when he calls himself a bodhisattva. There was just that, that little bit that's lacking that really is everything between a compassionate, deeply compassionate human being and someone who's imbued with the wisdom of a Buddha. And that really is a difference. So, and just as an aside note, there, there's a lot more to this article and I really encourage you to read it or buy the book when it comes out and read it in here. Um, <laughs> I took the Bodhisattva vow and I took it at a really beautiful and elaborate ceremony over three days uh, up at uh, KTD Monastery up in Woodstock, which is, if you're ever up there, to just it's worth going to see and meditate in their hall. It's just a magnificent place. Um, and it was very, very important for me to, to take that ceremony, a kind of beautiful ceremony, and um, the person who I used to call my root guru, um, it was just remarkable to be with him uh, for those three days, even though he didn't speak any English. It was, it really, it was, it, I don't know that I, I'm qualified to describe as an, as an awakened human being, but he was certainly a very advanced bodhisattva. Um, and even though that ceremony was so meaningful, once I actually finished it, um, it was also about that time that I was really starting to question, what am I doing? This really doesn't seem to be making sense. Um, and it was at that point that I started looking for, there's got to be a way to find out what the Buddha actually taught. 
um, so I didn't. You, I didn't when, when did you start reading the actual polycanon? Right, right after that. Oh, so you, you know, hadn't read that before. No, it was, and it was often presented to me as, um, for one thing, it's it's almost impossible to understand, and you really can't rely on it. I mean, a, a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. and it was, if it it was mostly it was just diminished in importance. There were other things to to focus on: heart sutra, lotus sutra, platform sutra, diamond sutra, etc. Uh, rituals and practices and all these other things. Is that when you, Tibetan? Um, there's aspects of Tibetan, and so yes, I was in I was in a, a Tibetan lineage at the time, and there was so much else to do, studying, and it wasn't studying the canon, and it wasn't a whole lot of time for meditation because you were there was a lot of rituals and stuff, a lot of chanting, a lot of other things that you had to do. Very beautiful. I, I I've said it here a few times. I wish I could be a Tibetan Buddhist. They, they got the best monasteries. They got the be most beautiful clothes. They got the most intricate, <laughs> intricate meditations. The art. They, I, it, really, it's magnificent. They, what's the what's the place in New York that the Rubin Museum? Yes. It, it just just to go see that whole tradition and understand how it's developed. It's worth a couple of days in that museum. It's just remarkable. But and nevertheless, I, I got to the point where it just became increasingly more difficult to. Continue it. It just, it just didn't. It, it, I was just getting more confused and more frustrated. Um, so I went to the Zen school for a couple of years. But during that time, I started now looking at the Pali Canon, and it was during that, it, probably a, a short while later after I took the vows, that I, I formally renounced the vows because to me, a vow is something that's important. It, it will, I think it'll, it'll guide you if you maintain it. And so, and again, not to mean any disrespect, but it was important for me to acknowledge that that was something that I can no longer hold to because I understood now that what I was hoping to achieve was something that was beyond even a bodhisattva. And I know that sounds very arrogant, especially to bodhisattvas, but it's exactly what the Buddha taught. So in this room, we are all very compassionate people. We all have the essence of the bodhisattva. The Pali word, by the way, is bodhisattva. Um, but there's something beyond that. There's something that will bring lasting peace and happiness. And if we really want to fulfill that vow of the Bodhisattva, which, by the way, that it, that uh, contradicts what the Buddha taught, that dukkha will occur. And so if dukkha will occur, original, its individual origination is craving and clinging, then no matter how wonderful a Bodhisattva I become, I can't affect anybody else's craving and clinging, can I? Nobody has that power. This is to be developed individually and through our own awareness that we can achieve the bodhisattva state and then go beyond. So nobody, and a, a simple way of saying it, the Buddha never saw himself as a savior. He never saw his teachings as salvific. He understood that nobody, no matter how advanced you may be, can change anybody else. You can't save anybody. But you hear me say it nearly every week. The most loving thing that I can do, and it's because of this understanding that I say this, the most loving thing I can do for <laughs> myself and for every other sentient being is to take to the Dhamma and awaken. The simplest reason is at least I'm not contributing to the world's dukkha anymore. And hopefully I'm not. Maybe I am. I don't know. <laughs> but also then I can understand the path. I haven't dismissed the path and taken another path, the Bodhisattva path. I've developed the path well enough that I can at least sit here and try and explain it to you in hopefully a meaningful way, which is exactly what the, and again, I'm not calling myself the Buddha. He never called himself a Buddha either, by the way. He awakened, he, be, he went past being a Bodhisattva, and then he started teaching. He taught other people how to do the same. So there, again, there's a lot more to that article, but I think I've gone far enough about the Pali Canon. <laughs> but I hope I really, I, it's, it's important that we understand where these teachings come from. It didn't, you know, it didn't just come out of what I hoped it would be. And again, I started this the whole talk with this. I guess I wasn't quite done that these teachings are still available. And now you understand that uh, we, can, we can really take uh, some confidence in the authenticity of it. So thank you for listening. Um, any questions about tonight's talk? And then we'll just go around the room. I wanted to um, add a little something, uh, like a little shout out to the to Theravadans that they have uh, also preserved the language. Yes. Uh, and I only found this out quite recently that in, in a place like Thailand, the government will uh, have. Um, 
examinations. Yep. You, you pass the, the first, second, third level of, of poly, and, and it allowed this, this whole scholarship into Absolutely. The, uh, in, 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 to, to keep going. Yeah. It, it, Tom, is that something that only adults participate in? Like, is that it's not taught in schools? It's a. Um, I am not sure. I, I haven't looked at it that closely, but I, I've seen several, you know, reading but it's not a people's current. accounts, like uh, either students of, of uh, Buddhism or or monks themselves, they talk about like, well, I have to sit for my my government exam in public because otherwise I I couldn't be a monk or uh, it's it's. It's really entrenched in the, uh, in the whole society there. But it's not spoken every. It's not an everyday language anymore. No, it's, it's purely for scholarship. It's is that purely to, to study the Dharma. Where is that? Thailand. That I know of. That, that's where I find the yeah. There's online resources too. There's a few places that you can that actually you can study the Pali language. Mm -hmm. um, you're absolutely right. It's the through the Theravada yeah. effort that it's been preserved. Um, and it's yes. honestly, it's mostly through Tanisara Bhikkhu's uh, yes. translations of the Pali yes. that were so useful for me in yes. studying and, and understanding what they're yes. Bhikkhu Bodhi's done a good job. I have a cousin, his name is Carl Olson, um, who's done scholarly interpretations, but they're really, really dry. Um, but he's he's kind of recognized as an authority in that that field. Inter I hope he's not listening. Interesting enough, I don't think he's ever meditated a day in his life. But but it, it really is brilliant. And his books about the uh, the compare is a professor of comparative religions. Comparing the the different Buddhist religions and the way they're developed has helped me a lot in understanding, and that's included in this article. Although I don't cite him, uh, I probably should. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, the, 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 I, I hope I didn't sound like I'm putting down the modern Theravadas. They are, it's they're as responsible for the preservation of the Pali and for some of the scholarly translations more than probably anybody today. Yeah, but again, it's just important to recognize that they're, what they practice today is often different than what the Buddha actually taught. Just the way it is. Matt, good to see you tonight. Good to see you, John. Thanks for uh, the talk tonight. That was very, uh, very informative, very, you know, I'm interested in the history. And you know, I was a religious studies major, so this is all right up my alley. Um, <laughs> Really grateful to to have access to authentic teachings, and and the way that you teach here is, you know, really the bones of it. So, really grateful. Thank you, you. Stefan. Good to see you tonight. Good to see you too. Oh, uh, I think maybe I'll just pass it. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Ron, good to see you. Good to see everybody. Uh, yeah, it, it's, for me, it was always the question when I first came here, like, how can this stuff still work? Uh, huh? Apparently, yes, it worked in, in then. And uh, I can see why, why people want to disparage the, the original Don. It's, it's just, you can't believe that after 2,600 years, this would still work. Yep. Comes up a lot, you know. But it takes it takes an effort, uh, both in, in studying and in in intention uh, and in effort to yeah. to practice the Dharma to finally see. Damn, it works. Yeah. Um, all the all the right to to continue on this path because you know, it's it's a it's a well trodden path. Yeah. Um, although you know, there may be some 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 parts missing here and there uh, that you can't see in the past, but uh, yeah, the teachings are here and, yeah. and they work. And why not follow them? That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. And just like the Buddha said, I have a secret. Come and see for yourself. You got to try it out. That's the only way you can know. So thank you, Judy. Good to see you tonight. How are you doing? Hi um, I just like the fact that it's something that people can do. And kind of get to different perspective, yeah. and that's that's what I like about it. It's it's 
that helps you live your life in a better way. Yep. That's all I want. I don't want, I don't, I didn't come here for some sort of faith-based something. I came for a way of getting, you know, a different perspective. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, a lot of times when you talk about clean craving and, you know, I've always had issues with food. I would always eat when I was, always eat when I'm stressed. And I realized that I have done that for so long that when I am stressed, I think I'm hungry. Mm, yeah. Condition response. Yeah. And so just as I realized, if I take some nice deep breaths, I no longer feel the need to eat. And it's remarkable. So what it is, is that I was attaching stress to hunger and thus the need to eat. And then said, well, why do you need to eat even if you're hungry? It's, you can, I mean, you're not starving. I, lose, I can lose 40 pounds. So obviously I don't need to eat right now just because I'm feeling a little hungry. I can finish what I'm doing and eat later. And this is, I, I grew up in a, in a family where if you were upset, the thing to solve it was to eat. You know, have a session, have a little something to eat. <laughs> so, you know, uh, eating is what made you feel better. Okay. So, I mean, I knew that was going on, but it was just before, but putting it in this context where I said, just because you're hungry doesn't mean you have to eat right now. Okay. You can just take a deep breath, and in a little while you can go eat something. So I'm trying to think that way now. I'll let you know if it works. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Please. But, but, Judy, you're oh, gaining control of your mind. Oh. <laughs> and the Vitaka Santana Sutta, the Buddha finishes this Sutta, means relaxation of thoughts. The Buddha finishes that Sutta by saying, you gain the ability to think what you want to think when you want to think it. That's what you're describing. That's what. That's the essence of concentration. You don't just have a thought and have to act on it anymore. You can take a breath. Thank you. Judy, good to see you tonight. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you for tonight and all the other nights. And I'm just really grateful that you're here. <laughs> thank you, too. I can continue to do this. Oh, thank you. It's, it's very helpful for me in my life. So. Thank you. Helen, good to see you tonight. Thank you, John. Good to be here. Um, just that whole idea of something that is then interpreted in other other ways by other people. It's like the game of telephone where yeah. things change. And, you know, and <clears throat> this is just sort of a family story. Um, very creative sister Liz mm -hmm. had this idea to take um, a family story and make it into an art project. And um, when we were kids um, and my mother would go grocery shopping, she would leave my older brother in charge of us. And um, so one day, mom drove down the driveway and then we all scattered and tore all the cushions off the sofa and piled them high in the living room and someone ran and got the plunger and handed it to the youngest kid and we proceeded oh. to stick them on the ceiling <laughs> above this tower of pillows. And it's, you know, it's the plunger story. and. So many, many years later, Liz had the idea of asking us all to write down our, our memory of this day. <laughs> Some of us weren't even born yet, but they had heard the story so much. So she, <laughs> she constructed this book called Nine by Nine, Nine Stories by Nine of Us. And it's fascinating how different each one of us has put a spin on this story and as she is created this book made out of triangles that assemble together or open up and in each triangle is our story wow so on in one story it was a rainy day in one story it was a sunny day in one story it was daytime in one story it was afternoon whatever it was but um there's the there's 
enough of the story that's consistent throughout, but slight variations. Mm. I imagine that's a bit of what's gone on with the Buddha's story. Oh, yeah. Um, our intent was just to express everyone's vision, everyone's, you know, like the blind man and the elephant, everyone's feeling a different part of the elephant. Um, and so for us, it wasn't that we all came up with the same story, which is different than what we're talking about now, but it's just a family event came into my mind as you were describing the different translations of the Buddha's words. That's all I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is, it, is the book ever published? Oh, it's, it's an art book, yeah. There's three editions. Really? Yeah. Two belong to Lafayette College and one belongs to me. I can show it to you. If you I'd, I'd love to see it. I've never actually even read all of them. I should take them Yeah, I especially want to read Helen's We weren't account. allowed to share them as we were writing. <laughs> it took me a year to collect <laughs> I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to see it. It's about memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Love your. Well, I, I one just one question. What happened when your brother saw the punters on the ceiling? My mother? Your, the, your brother, who was in charge of you. Oh, he was in charge. Oh! He was going to get the plunger guy. He was strong enough to stick the plunger to the ceiling. He yeah. was the one who was yeah. yeah. Okay, so then, then the next question is what happened when your mother saw the plungers on the ceiling? I don't. I might think. I, mean, I think the fact that there was a weight of the child that was hanging. <laughs> it was physics. Yeah. Um, she was. She, as long as there was no blood, she was she was pretty cool. okay with our creative endeavors. As long as she didn't have to stop and take someone to the hospital for right. stitches. Sometimes when we all took up all the seats in the waiting room, <laughs> when somebody did have stitches, we'd bring board games to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> you know the drill, bring the We're cheesy. All night. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Bonnie, how are you tonight? Oh, it's nice to be here and hear other people's stories. Yeah. I'm grateful for being able to come and be still and, uh, and stop the condition line. Yeah. So. I, I want to say something about Judy was talking about, you know, the, the culture of food, and I understand that. You know, food was love, and if you didn't love the maker of, if you didn't eat the food, or you know, then you didn't love the maker of the food mm -hmm. too. So there's all kinds of cuckooness <laughs> connected to the food is love. You're not eating. Why are you not eating? Mm -hmm. Who's going to eat that? There's probably no bigger sensory indulgence is it food. And there's so much about that. You got me, Judy. Think of that. Great movie, like Water for Chocolate. Mm -hmm. It's all about that. Yeah. <laughs> Liz, good to see you tonight. Good to see you guys too. Um, I love the the opportunity to come and sit and sit in stillness. It was really one of the few things I liked about um, being a Catholic was <laughs> that time on a Sunday morning to sit and kind of quiet. Yeah. You know? I, I missed that after I left the church, but. Um, I think it's important, although I, I didn't get every nugget of wisdom you said tonight, it's important to put things in context. Uh -huh. I think it's something that's truly missing in our um, culture today, a uh, lack of historic context. Yeah. But um, so anyway, that's, that's all I wanted to say. I think it's important to have some context to it. And it was part of... Um, you know, as I was exploring other ways of looking at that I was doing for myself, you know, I looked in Tibetan, into Tibetan Buddhism and um, and got completely confused and thought it was kind of me, yeah. not understanding on some intellectual level the whole idea of the bodhisattva vows. The way I understood it was that you were just taking a vow, that you were committing to... Like, 
that was, would that be the right, correct definition? Uh, it's saying that you were going to commit yourself to be on this path. It, it's usually presented as the more, more than that, that you're, that you're, you're are seeking enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. Right. And which implies that you can actually end dukkha, which yeah. contradicts the first noble truth. Yeah. It, again, it sounds reasonable and very compassionate until you understand the four noble truths. You know? And then it, it's also, and again, in the, in, even when it's presented that way, that's presented as the path that it's just the aspiration. Um, it's often if often referred to as preceding the bodhisattva vow is bodhicitta, which means the mind that aspires towards awakening. And it's that mind, bodhicitta, that is supposed to be enough to carry you through. And then you can just engage in conceptual. I got an interesting question from a student today, or an observation that between saying that you should be a good person like most religions do, they give you guidelines. You should be this way. You should be honest and loving. Okay, that's fine. The, the, what the Buddha realized, the significant difference is that we should we all aspire to compassion, but we have this thing called conditioned thinking that holds us back often. So sometimes we'll be very compassionate, and sometimes we might smack the dog. You know, that's what's lacking, and that's what's lacking in just the idea of aspiring towards awakening. You can aspire to it, but you need a, an eightfold path to do it. Again, it's the difference between what the Buddha taught and what has developed later. Even some of the later schools that mention the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path, they're, they're mentioned almost as uh, they're anachronisms. They're not really that important. Right. This is something what the Buddha taught, but this is really what we do here now. Rather like, than being one of the most important elements. Yeah, and, and lacking that, again, it's a, just to keep making a point, the Buddha awakened to that it is ignorance of Four Noble Truths that leads to suffering. So when you when you substitute that original teaching that it's not ignorance, there's nothing to lead you towards the Four Noble Truths. And even if you even if you get there somehow, if it's altered in some way, all that, all that I really need to do is to meditate long and hard enough and hope for my inner Buddha nature to arise. Okay, you know, again, it might work, but it didn't make sense to me. So. Well, the thing that. Um, in, in just this brief um, encounter with Tibetan Buddhism that I went through, um, uh, after this retreat I was on, by day four I was feeling like I was in a uh, dogmatic encampment, yeah. you know, where, and, it w and I could see where it was very similar to Catholicism, where this hierarchy was set up yep. to keep people place or at bay or needing to reach a level to to needing to go through a process to get to a level yeah. and and no you know a lifetime of working through levels to get somewhere yeah, was, many many lifetimes I yeah. really did by the day, by the time I left I felt like I was in yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of how I felt, and all the the different empowerments that you need, and you know, special merit, and do this for that. And, yeah, so see you, Judy. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And again, I'm not. It, it, it's it's a religion. It, it's a legitimate religion, just like all others. And are denigrated. I hope I'm not doing it. It's just different. You know, that's all. Lorna, good to see you. Um. Your knowledge of the history of the Buddha is a very impressive job. Um, and, uh, you, Are you saying that like uh, Alec Cliff Clavin? I guess I'm admitting <laughs> something about my past too. <laughs> That was the male. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
yeah, it's um, the hay is big is very impressive. It really is. Um, as far as my own practice is going, um, you, you have one sutta where there's a group of people that come and uh, they want to give a banquet for the Buddha. And um, he's the Buddha is sitting in his huh? tent or his shed or whatever. <laughs> And he hears a raucous outside sutta. The Buddha says they're grabbing at life. And you, he, you use that word grabbing. Yeah, grasping. Say, grasping or grabbing or yeah. something like that. Um, I'm beginning to just feel when I'm grasping or grabbing at life <coughs> that. Um, I'm not in a good place mentally. Yeah. I'm not in a stable, quiet, calm place mentally. Um, and I can just sort of feel that I'm out of whack with myself, a bit yeah. out of balance. And I start grabbing at life, grasping at life. And it usually happens when I'm in company. Yeah. You know, I, I, in, when I'm by myself, I can be a little bit more mellow. But when I'm in company, you just get that little bit anxious sometimes. And uh, I even caught myself thinking, you know, that it's it's when I'm a little bit not 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 stressed with the company, meaning it's that too, but I'm just more stressed in company. Sort of, um, can grab at life that way. I, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of beginning to get a, a little bit aware of that. And obviously I'm working on the <coughs> craving and clinging and trying um, kind to of keep my mind quiet, not make stories. Um, that's about it really, really. Thank you. That um, that's one of the reasons why the Vinaya rules came into place, so that the the sangha was focused on developing understanding through the Dhamma rather than just social interaction and what that can lead to. Uh, our retreat this weekend is going to be an example of that and how you live with other people but not having that social interaction be a distraction. It's a way of, actually can be a way of developing the Dhamma at a very deep level last year. Mm -hmm. And it can, it, all, every day of our life is an opportunity for that. But the whole point to me of a retreat is to create that environment so that we can really be engaged in the Dhamma for, you know, a few days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Norm, I mean Frank. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. I love that you challenging my brain to understand this stuff. You know, I'm still on the five pointing aggregate, <laughs> and, I feel, and I feel comfortable there. Uh, I know how important it is to clarify and you know, the context that everyone's talking around. And thanks everybody for sharing. Um, I go right back to keep it simple because I have a chaotic life okay. and um, six days a week within 32 employees where everyone's an individual and everyone's eye making and the most important person in the world. Um, it allows. So I go right back to like the first four um, a full path, like the right view enables me to, to stay in right thought. And right intention helps me, uh, increases my understanding of what's going on in here personally. And then as long as I stay in the right speech, my actions are right, people to be who they are. So there's like a thin line of trying to maintain um, control, not control, but uh, order in a business and still offer respect to everybody um, without losing self-respect yeah. you know um, so the practice has been awesome for me and I remain grateful 
Um, like I said, the challenge is to understand more um, will keep me coming back. And um, every day, uh, I have a lot of opportunities to practice. And uh, I stay in meditation. Uh, and I take that off the cushion. Remember my breath, you know, I'll breath the day. So it helps you with, the, with your employees and clients? It helps the entire atmosphere because I'm at peace with myself. And it helps the relationships. The most loving thing you can do for them? Frank, you're you're right. You know, an essence of the essence of right view is keeping it simple. Because it is. There are some. It, it seems complicated at times because we're complicated. Our minds are conditioned that way. But the Dhamma itself is pretty simple and direct. Thank you. There was one other thing I wanted to add. Sorry. Um, no, I'll be sorry. So every human being has cravings and desires and you know, passion and all that stuff. So re remaining in right view and right intention, like in the beginning, like desires or passion would come up and then I would feel this strong attachment to those, those feelings, yeah. whatever. Um, and then I would have to renunciate. But now understanding what's going on, I don't really have to renunciate. Through understanding that it kind of like just goes away on its own. Yeah. You're not creating further self-referential views. You know, in a simpler way of saying is you're no longer clinging to what's arising to be any different than it is. It just is. You know, that's the essence of a mind of equanimity. Life is still going on. You're still in that same chaotic. If Frank runs, I don't know if anybody knows Stock Bakery down in Philly. It's a big bakery with a lot of stuff going on. But you're able to maintain a much calmer and peaceful mind. It's the essence of the Dhamma. It's why the Buddha taught it. Again, it's not so important where we're going to be 600 lifetimes. How we're living our life right now. What's the quality of our life? Am I at peace with what's occurring or not? And again, second noble truth. If you're not, it's because you're craving for or clinging to things being different than they are. Again, th thank you so much, Frank, for bringing that up. And it is. It really is simple. Great class, thank you. I hope I didn't bore you too much with the with the uh, thorny details of the Dhamma, but there they are. Um, we'll finish with with Meta. Uh, just a quick announcement. I sent an, an email out re regarding our retreat this weekend. If you didn't get it, um, a slight change in schedule. We're not. We're the, they changed their dinner hour to five thirty instead of five. So, and I won't give a, a, a talk before then. I think the original schedule had me going on about 4.15. You'll hear enough of me after. So if you get there, if you, you know, get there as early as you want, anytime after three, because it's a nice place to hang out and just be. Um, but try to get there so we can have our dinner together. But again, if not, o'clock. What's most important is don't stress going to a place to de-stress. I'm going to try. As long as there's a, a, a Wi-Fi or a, a cellular connection, I'm going to stream the, the talk. So you can, you can join me that way, too. They, I remember last year the Wi-Fi connection was pretty spotty, and I don't think there was anything downstairs where we, but I was able to get a cell connection so I can use my hotspot. Yeah, so I'm gonna try. We'll see. Even if it's not streamed, is it recorded? Uh, well, I, I'll, there's a voice recording that I'll make. You know, last year's oh, talks are on. Last year, I, I didn't go to the retreat, but I would walk the path here in Frenchtown just listening. Yeah, last year's talks are on the on the website yeah. too. So, yeah, and then, and yeah, if I can't stream it, I will record the talks and put them up early next week. So, but yeah, try to get there by five thirty, <laughs> certainly by seven. But again, don't stress at all. Get there. That's I most important. They could extend their Wi-Fi system to the building. They may have by now. I haven't I haven't checked. So let's we'll finish with meta as we always do. So find your relaxed meditative posture. Oh, and, and there's obviously no class Thursday or Saturday this week, but we'll be back on schedule next week. We should bring um, towels and... Well, pens. they have uh, everything you want. I found that the, the towels are kind of tiny, and I like a nice big fluffy towel. And, <laughs> and also, I probably shouldn't say this because you're all going to walk in there with, with your pillows, but I found their pillows a little bit lacking in yeah. support too, so you might want to bring a pillow. Uh, and, and, but, and there's little, those little bars of soap. So you really don't have to bring anything, but for your own comfort, you might want to bring your own towel, maybe your own pillow. Uh, it's supposed to be cool up there. 
things are well heated. Well, yeah, the inside will be fine, but we're going to be walking between the buildings to go for our meals. The rest of the time we will be in our building, so you might want to just bring a jacket. The great uh, hiking trails and walking trails, so you might want to bring some sturdy shoes for that. There's not supposed to be any rain, but you never know. Um, but it's a beautiful place. So. The food is great. Uh, and if, if you have, I think I asked you too, if you have any um, allergies, let me know and they'll accommodate you for that too. So. And if, if you're going to go walking, uh, bring a water bottle because they, they have good water available, but nothing to put it in. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah good point. Uh, and you know, the other things, I, I, don't, I don't insist that you don't, you know, bring a tablet or a computer or a cell phone, but if you do, it's really best to leave it in your car, you know, because you're on retreat. And we'll talk more about that to those that are coming on retreat, what that really means. But, you know, it, we, we leave the entanglements of the world behind and we take refuge in the Dhamma. Uh, so we don't want any distractions while we're, while we're there for the few days. So, all right, let's finish with Metta. Find your relaxed meditative posture. And gently close your eyes and gently close your mouth. And again, take a moment to become aware of the sensation of breathing in your body. And let that mindfulness of your breath cease any distracting thoughts to the past or to the future from our talk today. And Metta is both an aspiration for those of us developing the Eightfold Path and an expression of an awakened, fully mature human being. The Buddha's words from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied. Unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing and gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, Having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class. Peace. <laughs> Matt, could you give, give me just one second before you run out? Yeah. Let me get this together. I know you want to get home, but I'll keep you long.